Ah, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us today for this, uh, the last event, uh, VIU's Arts and Humanities Colloquium Series for 2019-2020. Uh, As always, I'm Dr. Tim Lewis, Chair of the VIU History Department, and it's been my pleasure to serve as host for each of the colloquium events this year. Let me begin by acknowledging that we have the great honor today of meeting on the traditional territory of the Sunema First Nation, and for that we are truly thankful. Haishka, please do whatever you can to further the process of reconciliation with indigenous peoples. Uh, today we are celebrating the 10th anniversary of this lecture series, and I'll say a bit more about that somewhat later. But if you have an anniversary, you must have cake Thus, cake will be served in the lobby after we're done here this morning, so please do join us. Yes, we'll have a nice, uh, lovely cake. Um, and, I, and I also want to express the Colloquium Planning Committee's sincere gratitude for the moral and financial support that's provided for us and has been for all 10 years from uh, the Office of the Dean of Arts and Humanities, led by Dr. Marnie Stanley. We could not do this work without uh, that help. And as the central topic of this morning's session is Shakespeare's Midsummer Night's Dream and the music it inspired, I've taken the liberty of paraphrasing a few lines from the play to reinforce our gratitude for Marnie's support. So, begin scene. <clears throat> Sweet Marnie, we thank thee for thy sunny beams and flow of loot. We thank thee, Marnie, for shining now so bright and being so astute. For by thy gracious golden glittering gleams, we can provide these talks in endless streams. End scene. There we go. Uh, uh, I think this Shakespeare guy has some potential. Um, anyway, now please join me in welcoming to the stage Dr. Ross McKay, VIU's Associate Vice President Academic, who will bring some words of greeting and provide the formal introduction for our speakers this morning. Uh, Ross McKay. Hello. Um, thank you all for uh, joining us today. Um, I would like to uh, first thank the Colloquium Committee and the Faculty of Arts and Humanities for its excellent work putting on this series over 10 years. Um, a hearty congratulations on your anniversary. Um, and I extend a, a warm welcome to those of you from the community. Uh, your support for the series over these 10 years has enabled it to grow from a modest sharing of ideas among 20 or 30 colleagues to this magnificent event. From its uh, inception, this series has simply tried to share with the uh, university community and the general public the essential work that the arts and humanities do. And more important, the series demonstrates, I think, uh, to students that work in the arts and humanities is valued, not only within the academy, but within society as well. Um, the work that has gone on here in ten, uh, over 10 years um, explored, has explored questions and themes, often provocative ones, that we do not always see represented in uh, mainstream culture. Most of my colleagues consider it a duty to share such work with the wider community. And perhaps now more than ever, we need uh, the arts and humanities to lead us. They bring uh, insight into human behavior, they ask critical questions, they attempt to make sense of the past in order to build a rational future, and they synthesize new developments from every field of human endeavor. In short, they provide an organizing framework and a narrative shape that enables us to assimilate complexity and make good judgments and decisions. And it's an extra special day uh, for me today because I have the honor of introducing two friends and colleagues, John Lepage and Sasha Krubler. I've known John for over 25 years. He's been a fine colleague and a mentor to me and a friend. I followed him eventually as chair of the English department and as dean of the faculty. And I always appreciated his wise but gentle counsel. Um, but I most enjoyed our conversations together. John is a teacher and a scholar who truly embraces the idea of the life of the mind. And conversations with him are always challenging, thought-provoking, 
and laden with his keen sense of humor. I'm delighted and not at all surprised that in retirement, John has turned to fiction, and I very much look forward to the fruits of his labors in that regard. Sasha Kerbler has been with the faculty since 2007, and I have come to really appreciate her consummate professionalism, her dedication to her students above all, and her amazing work ethic. Her knowledge of music is extraordinary and a little intimidating, in fact. Um, her experience with the CBC and in broadcasting generally is a great benefit to the department. Her awards and her scholarships are too numerous to list. Sasha and I also enjoy uh, conversing with each other and many a day's end in the dean's office she appeared uh, and what started out as a discussion of department business eventually turned into a wide-ranging conversation about almost anything. I'm delighted that these dear friends of mine have collaborated on this fascinating topic, and I'm very much looking forward to today's presentation, although I'm sorry I have to depart because events are <laughs> taking over right now, but this is recorded, so I will see it as soon as it's available. So uh, please uh, give a warm welcome to John and Sasha, and thank you very much for joining us today. The lunatic, the lover, and the poet are of imagination all compact. The poet's eye, in a fine frenzy rolling, doth glance from heaven to earth, from earth to heaven, and as imagination bodies forth the forms of things unknown, the poet's pen turns them to shapes and gives to airy nothing a local habitation and a name. The overture to Shakespeare's A Midsummer Night's Dream, composed at the age of 17, remains the quintessential Mendelssohnian miracle. Although Mendelssohn had already composed over 60 works by the time he wrote it, the overture emerged as the first through and through piece of romantic music in history. We have to remember that in August of 1826, Beethoven was still alive for another seven months, and so was Schubert for another two years, while Karl Maria von Weber, another representative of the early Romantic era, died about two months prior to Mendelssohn's completion of the work. Still, the moment it was premiered, musicologists and music critics determined that the program of Mendelssohn's overture and its musical content, namely its tonal finesses, the play of the light and dark, the presence of the supernatural and its elfin sound, to name a few, made it essentially romantic. As such, the success of the work represented both, the first crowning achievement, as well as an exhilarating starting point for the young composer. Felix Mendelssohn was a true prodigy, and his many talents were fully supported by his wealthy and well-educated family. Following in the steps of his grandfather, a famous philosopher, Moses Mendelssohn, who was the focal point of the German Enlightenment for over three decades, learning was something to be pursued with passion and enthusiasm. Felix's father, Abraham, was a successful banker and a kindly, well-educated man who was supportive of his children's pursuits in whatever field they chose. He engaged a wide variety of personal teachers and through them provided access to the most current experts in music, art, and literature. Felix's education included art, literature, languages, and philosophy. 
He was fluent in English and French. He knew Italian enough to translate some sonnets by Dante into German, and he studied both Greek and Latin. He entered the University of Berlin at the age of 16 and attended lectures on aesthetics with Hegel, among others. His sketches and watercolors were impressive, and his correspondence was in the great tradition of 19th century travel writing. As both parents, Leah and Abraham, were excellent amateur musicians, they took their children's music talent seriously too. Felix was given piano lessons by his mother at an early age and then tutored by a number of prominent piano teachers. When he turned eight, his father chose Carl Zelter to be his composition teacher. From him, Felix not only learned the craft, but also met the main figures of the music world. Felix's most important and enjoyable musical performances took place in his own home, as the family turned their household into a center of musical and cultural activity. His works were often performed by a private orchestra for the associates of his wealthy parents amongst the intellectual elite of Berlin. At the age of nine, however, Felix made his first public appearances too. He played the piano part in a trio for two horns and piano, and somewhat later performed in a two piano recital with the famous German pianist. He knew the works of the major composers inside out and performed them enthusiastically. At 11, Zelter took him to Weimar to meet Goethe. There he played numerous compositions by Bach, a piano version of Mozart's opera, Marriage of Figaro, and Beethoven's Fifth Symphony, as well as his own compositions and improvisations. No child since Mozart had composed more pro prolifically, writes one of Mendelssohn's biographers. At the age of 11, Felix began keeping a record of his compositions. By then, he had completed 60 works ranging from songs to chamber works. Between the ages of 12 and 14, he wrote 12 symphonies and the number of chamber works. This tremendous ma mass of music is mainly of academic interest today, but it's marked with the impeccable regard of form characteristic of all of his music. Through all of these achievements, Felix was considered strictly a gifted amateur, and it did not cross his father's mind that he might make a career as a musician. Later in life, he was surprised to find that other, less independently situated musicians regarded him as unfair competition because he was willing to accept engagements for token fees or none at all. So everything about Felix Mendelssohn's life was, in comparison to most musicians, unusual, if not unreal, almost dreamlike. Even the childhood entertainment he enjoyed was unusual. He and his older sister, Fanny, put on a series of Shakespearean performances at home in which the younger children, Rebecca and Paul, also took part. In 1825, the family moved to an estate in what was then a remote, almost rural area of Berlin. We learned that among the amenities of this luxurious establishment, which covered some 10 acres for Europe, that's huge, was a vast private park abounding in lofty trees, beautiful gardens, and subsidiary buildings of various sorts and sizes in addition to the dignified and spacious main house. The first summer, the children turned a part of the garden into a setting of outdoor Shakespeare. Their favorite play was A Midsummer Night's Dream, and Fanny remembered in after years how they each took turns at all the roles. It must have been magical to perform under illumination at night amidst their stately trees and fragrant lilacs, and as Felix put it, dream, a midsummer night's dream. No artist has ever recaptured his youth more perfectly than Mendelssohn in the Midsummer Night Dream. Composed a year after the family's move to the property, the work created a sensation among the first audience that heard it performed in the garden house. The signs of individuality started to appear gradually in Felix's smooth and sparkling early works. 
joined forces in this unique piece of musical sorcery. Soon after, invitations began arriving for him to conduct it elsewhere, and its first public performance was held at Stettin on February 20th, 1827. At the premiere, Berlin musicologist and critic A.B. Marx, who also influenced Mendelssohn's writing of the overture, uttered the prophetic words, here begins a new music. Ultimately, it was in Shakespeare that Mendelssohn unlocked the romantic side of his creative muse. If Shakespeare's play is a comedy with elements of fantasy, Mendelssohn's Midsummer Night is a fantasy with elements of comedy. Although Mendelssohn provides us with all the characters and the essential ingredients of the plot, there is still a difference between Shakespeare's order of events in the play, the order in which the characters are presented and the story is told, and Mendelssohn's. But before I get into details of the music, let's have John tell us more about the play. Thank you, Sasha. A Midsummer Night's Dream unfolds in two settings. The city, mythological Athens, and the forest. Apart from the opening and closing scenes, which take place in the court of Athens, the action is confined to the forest. Unlike other Shakespeare comedies, this is socially a blank canvas. There are no forest people, and there is no distinction between country and city folk. The play's class distinctions have to do with the idle upper classes and the city dweller tradesmen, or mechanicals, whom Shakespeare uses to illustrate literal mechanical thinking or lack of imagination. It is not clear, however, that the upper classes are any more open to the imagination than the dim-witted tradesmen. If there are no forest people in the play, there are forest spirits, fairies, whose influences are not limited to this setting and whose life dramas reflect those of the court. Oberon and Titania, the king and queen of the fairies, identify themselves with the betrothed couple, Theseus, Duke of Athens, and Hippolyta, queen of the Amazons. And their marital relationship unfolds with a complexity suggesting tensions only hinted at in the Athenian royals. If it helps you to think of it in these terms, the fairy tale and forest setting may be linked to the wilds of Vancouver Island for Megan and Harry as a place of escape from the crippling constraints of courtly life. Of course, any such comparison must end there. Above all, the forest is Shakespeare's setting for imaginative escape or fantasy. There is one other notable aspect of the setting in the play. The action takes place at night. It is possible to imagine the courtly beginning and ending as daylight when windows on the obscurity of the forest and night. But they too are so animated by concepts of night, sleep, and dreams that the play is defined by them. Take this passage from the opening scene of the play. Four happy days bring in another moon. But oh, methinks, how slow this old moon wanes. She lingers my desires, like to a stepdam or a dowager, long withering, withering out a young man's revenue. To these strangely misogynistic words, 
spoken by Theseus, Hippolyta responds, Four days will quickly steep themselves in night. Four nights will quickly dream away the time. Hippolyta reminds us that the dream that dreams erode all sense of time, including those by which young women become old widows sucking up young men's fortunes. In short, the play is defined by timeless dreams, and the night and the forest are different representations of the same idea. Just as the forest dismisses conventional societal rules, night overturns reality, shrouding it in uncertainty, replacing it with sleep and surreal dreams. Bear with me as I give as brief a summary as I can of the action of A Midsummer Night's Dream. In court, Theseus, Duke of Athens, prepares to marry Hippolyta, Queen of the Amazons, whom he once defeated in battle. In advance of the wedding, the Duke attends to matters of state. Aegeus, a prominent citizen, petitions for his daughter Hermia's marriage to Demetrius against her will. Demetrius is in love with Hermia and has Aegeus' approval. Hermia is in love with and is loved by Lysander. Hermia's friend Helena is in love with Demetrius, who had once made promises of love to her. Under Athenian law, Hermia must bow to her father's will or either be executed or become a nun. Hermia and Lysander vow to leave Athens for the forest. Demetrius and Helena determine separately to follow them. Six tradesmen propose to offer a play in honor of the Duke's wedding, and they plan to meet in the forest to rehearse. The scene changes, not surprisingly, to the forest. Oberon and Titania, king and queen of fairies, are having a marital, marital squabble. In playful malice, Oberon applies a love potion to Titania's sleeping eyes to make her fall in love with the first person she sees when she wakes. He tells Robin Goodfellow, or Puck, to do the same for Demetrius to make him fall in love with Helena. Lysander and Hermia, lost, lie down to sleep. Puck, seeing Lysander, mistakenly anoints his eyes with the potion. Helena comes upon Lysander in his sleep. He awakens and professes ardent love for her. The tradesmen rehearse. For his consummate acting skills, Puck rewards one of the tradesmen, Bottom, with an ass's head. The frightened actors disperse. Titania awakens and falls in love with Bottom, ass head and all. She lavishes the perfections of fairyland on him. Oberon now applies the love potion to Demetrius' sleeping eyes. Helena alter enters, followed by Lysander. Demetrius awakens and professes his love for Helena. Helena thinks the men are mocking her. Hermia enters and is rejected by Lysander and Demetrius. To prevent the men from fighting, Oberon covers them in sleep, and he reverses the effects of the potion on them and Titania. Oberon and Titania are reconciled. Theseus and Hippolyta visit the forest where the young lovers wake up restored to their proper feelings. 
Demetrius can't understand why he ever rejected Helena. Theseus announces a triple wedding. Bottom is restored and returned to his fellow actors. Back in court, the Athenians assemble for the wedding of Theseus and Hippolyta, Lysander and Hermia, and Demetrius and Helena. As part of the marriage entertainments, the tradesmen perform the tragic love story of Pyramus and Thisbe. The fairies give uh, an epilogue. For your amusement, I have included a graphic representation of the disordered love relationships found in the play, uh, courtesy of the Actors Shakespeare Project in Massachusetts. So you can peruse that at your, at your at length and probably still make no additional sense. Um, to move along. It is a feature of Shakespearean comedy to return the disordered world to order in the closing act. But in A Midsummer Night's Dream, while the characters return to their normal lives, their marriage celebration does not end with order. Instead, the play concludes with the disorderly and funny play within the play and the musical epilogue of the out of control fairies. The play itself amounts to little more than fairy dust. If we shadows have offended, says Puck in the epilogue, imagine that you have slumbered and this weak and idle theme no more yielding but a dream. We are thus invited to understand that nighttime dreams and fantasy and the ways in which they signal the human imagination are the commanding subjects of the play. This is partly why A Midsummer Night's Dream persists as one of Shakespeare's most popular works. The plot may appear difficult to follow, but the play is simple in essence. It shows us how the real may assume the proportions of a dream and how dreams may assume the proportions of the real. What complexity there is serves the purposes of comic effect. Bottom says of the dream he has wakened from near the end of the play, that of his love with his love uh, episode with Titania. It shall be called Bottom's Dream because it hath no bottom. To be sure, his dream is shallow. Otherwise, everything boils down to showing off the prodigious effects of the imagination as a powerful replacement for the real. Near the end of the play, Theseus disparage. He disparages such wanton displays. Whoops. I never may believe these antique fables, nor these fairy toys. Lovers and madmen have such seething brains such shaping fantasies that apprehend more than cool reason ever comprehends. The lunatic, the lover, and the poet are of imagination all compact. The poet's eye in a fine frenzy rolling doth glance from heaven to earth, from earth to heaven, and as imagination bodies forth the forms of things unknown, the poet's pen turns them to shapes and gives to airy nothing a local habitation and a name. The more Theseus says on the subject, 
the more we realize that this is not criticism, but praise. Disputing his cool reason, Hippolytus speaks of something magical growing from the forest occurrences maligned by Theseus, something of great constancy, but howsoever strange and admirable. Lest we fall into the trap of believing there is a clear distinction between the real world of the court of Athens and the fantastic realm of the forest, however, we should remember that Shakespeare took the framework of the plot, the one involving Theseus and Hippolyta from classical mythology. The real world characters in the play are no more than the effects of antique fables. There are other issues in A Midsummer Night's Dream but they amount to little more than subjects of whimsical speculation and ones Shakespeare investigated throughout his career. For example, the same Shakespeare who gives the devil his due typically champions the, the disenfranchised and abused. The laws of Athens are clearly unfair. And in the end, the play seems to vindicate the choices of individuals over the society. Authority has little moral sway, and men behave on the whole more capriciously than women. There is no moral standard to extrapolate from the fairy world, of course, for it is at best amoral. But Oberon's comic interventions against Titania give us pause to reflect in a 16th century version of Me Too on men behaving badly. Such behavior, however, does not warrant alterations like that made in a 2019 production at the Bridge Theatre in London in which the roles of Oberon and Titania are reversed culminating in a scene in which Oberon and Bottom frolic together in a bubble bath. In my reading of A Midsummer Night's Dream, night, dreams, fantasy, and the imagination triumph over cool reason and reality. This play reveals young Shakespeare showing off his virtuoso skill in the sphere of the imagination and it revels in the uncertainties of night. We cannot help but imagine courtly nighttime celebration and pageantry, bright lights against a dark background. On the surface, we might expect the play to be a mood piece. However, despite the darkness, there is none of the emotional darkness that colors the later comedies and nothing of the darkness that extinguishes life in tragedies like Macbeth. Its lightness may be another reason for the play's popularity. It doesn't wallow in heady themes. Its aims are effervescent. Nowhere is this more vivid than in the fairy world, which is regulated by a musicality unrivaled except in Shakespeare's last play, The Tempest. It is not that there is more music in A Midsummer Night's Dream, but that music is in the air, in the names of the fairies, peas blossom, cobweb, moat, mustard seed, in the simple songs they sing, and in the ways in which they lie suspended, like moats and cobwebs, over the fabric of the play. No doubt the musicality of A Midsummer Night's Dream was part of its appeal for Felix Mendelssohn. Modulations of night and day are essential to music and have provided endless inspiration for composers. 
in Shakespeare's period, a circle of courtiers known as the School of Night composed sonnets and songs on the theme of night. Similarly, the music of his contemporaries, such as the songs of John Dowland, often celebrated night thoughts and a mood bordering on indulgent, if not joyful, melancholy. Later composers captivated by the emotional space between the minor and major keys explored the vast terrain of melancholy. In a favorite memory from my childhood, I often lay in bed at night charged with romantic melancholy, listening to my brother play the Moonlight Sonata on the piano. My brother may have felt similar enthusiasms, for I only ever heard him play the sonata at night. Perhaps Sasha will tell us otherwise, but the night Mendelssohn responds to appears to come from the magical well of fantastic possibility rather than the deep well of sadness. And uh, that is very true, John. I must say, although the overture and all of its themes are built on one of the musical codes that has represented melancholy in music for centuries, the code of lament that John Dowland himself had used too, sadness is not really the emotion that Mendelssohn explores. We get to hear it for a moment, we do, but he does not dwell on it. It is rather the contrary. He infuses the night with the sounds of effervescence, if I may use your perfect word for it, and with what has been termed as the spirit of enchantment, such as had rarely been heard before. So let's see how, let's see how. The overture from the French word ouverture opens an opera. In it, using exclusively instruments, composers convey the gist of the narrative that is about to unfold. Their aim is twofold. They have to deliver it through the materials of music, as well as organize their musical content into a type of form that will make the narrative clear. Every story, every narrative, is about a change. In other words, its gist is captured in some form of a transformation from being something to becoming something else. So the point of a story is in the change it depicts. Where is that change in the Midsummer Night Dream? Whose situation is transformed by the time the story is finished? Who has become happy from being unhappy? The lovers, I can sort of hear it somewhere in the back. The lovers. Therefore, the composer has to figure out a way how to portray this change in music. Historically, composers have used a particular music form for their overtures, the so-called sonata form. Such was the case with Mendelssohn. Although his overture is a self-standing composition with no opera to introduce, the aim is the same. He has a story to tell, and the sonata form is a perfect vehicle for it. Like a story, the sonata form comprises of three large sections, the exposition, the development, and the recapitulation. The exposition, interesting, sorry. Ah, here we are. The exposition introduces the main characters. The first theme is usually more assertive and forceful. Uh, it used to be referred to as masculine, believe it or not. While the second theme, so the one in red, is more reserved and gentler of course, used to be referred to as feminine. However, they are in disagreement. And how do we know that? Because the first theme is presented in the key of the tonic, the home key, while the second is presented in the contrasting key, usually that of the dominant. These two functions are perceived as sitting at the opposite ends of a scale, home versus far away from home. No tension versus tension, 
and so on. As the first theme is to occur in the home key and the second in the key of the dominant, a composer needs to write a transition in between them. So right in here, a passage that will bridge the gap between the two keys, or in music terminology, modulate from the home key to the key of the dominant. Then the second theme enters, followed by a closing passage right here, or theme that confirms that new key. In addition to their character and the tonality they use, these themes are also contrasted by the tempo. The second is always played a bit more slowly. The development, located in the middle, contains the drama. Here, the dispute is being worked out. It begins in the contrasting key, so we can see that the contrasting key lasts all the way through, the key of the opposition, and in it, the composer works through the previously heard material or its various fragments to resolve the disagreement established in the exposition. Often, this means reaching a distant key as well as resolving some other music-related issues that he has set up for himself earlier. Whichever keys and far faraway lands we have been through here, the end of the development section will prepare us for a return to the home key, where then all will be reconciled. The recapitulation, so the last section, looks like a restatement of the exposition, doesn't it? We see the first theme, the transition turned into retransition, that leads to the second theme, a closing, and then a coda, which is a more extended, um, uh, kind of like a, um, a closure type section. I usually tell my students it's like running the credits at the end of the film. Thank you to this theme and to that key and this modulation <laughs> and, and, and so on, right? But it is also something like the famous last words. Although the subsections and their order are the same, there is a change here you can see in terms of keys in which they're presented. In the exposition, the opposition was presented in the terms of contrasting key. Here it is heard in the same key, in the same key, meaning that the themes have reconciled. How so? Well, as there's no change to what happened to the first theme, it looks like the second theme has gone through a transformation and has somehow changed its mind if you wish. It is now in the home key with the first, therefore in agreement. All is well that ends well. The closing will be in the home key too, as well as the coda. So how is Shakespeare's narrative portrayed in Mendelssohn's sonata form? In a letter to his publisher, Mendelssohn revealed some of the program. I believe it will suffice to remember how the rulers of the elves Oberon and Titania constantly appear throughout the play with all their train, now here and now there. Then comes Prince Theseus of Athens and joins a hunting party in the forest with his wife. I don't know if you can see, this is all down here. And then the two pairs of tender lovers who lose and find themselves. Finally, the troop of clumsy, coarse tradesmen who ply their ponderous amusements. Then again, the elves, who, know, who entice all, and on this piece, and on this, the piece is con constructed. When at the end all is happily resolved, the elves return, that's here at the very end, and bless the house and disappear as morning arrives. So ends the play and my overture too. And we can see from the diagram here underneath that uh, Mendelssohn has really well kind of populated the sonata for, uh, form with all of the characters or at least some form of their representation. Musically speaking, therefore, there are six elements that can be heard in the exposition. The four chords that open a whole moonlit universe, so they are right here. The fairyland run by Oberon and Titania. Theseus, in other words, the Athenian royalty. The lovers, the mechanicals, 
and the hunting horns that are at the very end of the exposition, basically telling us uh, off we go to the forest or something like that. So Mendelssohn's overture doesn't open in Theseus's court with the first theme representing Theseus, the masculine, right? And Hippolyta, the feminine, as we meet them at the beginning of Shakespeare's narrative. It opens, as scholars have put it, with the chords whose progression reveals the presence of the supernatural. How so? The coexistence of the physical darkness and the emotional lightness is portrayed by Mendelssohn's use of the so-called mode mixture, which musicians understand as a coexistence of the two main scales, that of major and minor. So let's hear them. So the key that we're in is the key of E major, of E major. I'm sorry for um, the grainy representation of it, but it's hard to tell on my PowerPoint at home, this small, how it's going to look here. My point is, it's the E major that we heard. That was the first chord, the second chord. So it was one, five, the four, and then the last one, first chord again. So it's obviously in the scale of E major, there's no question here. This is what we are hearing. Now, the E major scale will also have chords above every of its pitches right here. And these chords, because of these black keys, let's say, on the piano, will put some black keys in here as well. So if I were to play them all one after another, it's not particularly exciting, but you get to hear kind of the sound of the key. So first degree, second degree, third, four, five, six, the seventh, diminished, and again, one. The E minor scale, so the scale that musician would say coexists with E major because many of the pitches are the same. E is there, F sharp is there, G is different. A is the same, B is the same, C. C sharp is different, D, D sharp is different, and E. So this kind of scale, Greek modes, and then later church modes, when we put the chords above it, so this is a, just another kind of um, um, minor scale uh, where we have the leading tone raised, which is important. The leading tone is raised, it gives us a resolution, sense of resolution to one. So let's play that. a change in color. When the chords are put above that one, the picture is different. So what we are hearing is minor chord, diminished, augmented, minor, major, major, diminished, and back to minor. So it's a different color from what we heard in E major, there's no question about that. When superimposed, so when we put them one above the other, then you can see also that when we compare the chords, E without G sharp in the G sharp, F sharp, A, C, F sharp, A, C sharp, G sharp, or E sharp as opposed to G, E, A, C, E as opposed to A, C sharp, E, so on, so on. We will see that the only chord that they share But basically, it's a bridge from which the composer can 
I then move from minor k over the bridge into the major, or the other way, the other way around, from the major to the minor. So let's play something, um, just a chord progression that will um, that will portray that. So let's start in minor key and play the first degree, in minor key. Fourth degree, the fifth, and I'm switching into major after that. mode, right, developed from uh, that mode, Aeolian, one of the old Greek modes, the modes of antiquity, it has been perceived in the music world as older than the major scale. The supernatural forces, too, are believed to be older than we are, hence the code. So let's hear these chords perhaps one more time. And so the chords will be followed as we go through the overture uh, by what's been termed as Mendelssohn's elfin music. It portrays the fairyland in that older key. So what he's basically done here, he started it in E major, went to the dominant, also major sounding chord, went to the subdominant, the eerie sounding minor chord, and will start portraying the fairyland in the minor key. So instead of E major chord, we'll be hearing the E minor chord. Um, the shimmering wings of the fairies uh, are just about audible, as you'll be able to hear, and um, as we can hear them really busily scurrying around. The upcoming lengthened chords will signal Oberon's um, uh, magic potion that uh, he initially plans to use twice. But if you remember the story, the potion will be actually used three times. Um, uh, and the sound of its application in the development section will be much mightier than what we have just heard here. So let's hear the fairyland. In e minor. Here's the chord coming up.
the spooks, as I refer to it. So at this point, this is just in the plans. Tanya needs it and Demetrius. So the second line is coming. And so on and so on. Theseus' theme follows as the true first theme would. And in the home, of Kim, uh, home key of E major, forceful and executive portraying him as somewhat square and pompous and joined by the hunting horns. and so on and so on. The transition is here to take us from the home key to the contrasting key, that of B major. Here we're joined by the folk. The loud and raw sounds of the, of the Orphic light give it away. And we hear the hustle and bustle of the upcoming wedding preparations. As we reach the new key, the entry of the lovers is being prepared. So they're presented as the opposition in the key of B major because Hermia does not want to do what is asked of her to marry Demetrius, but be with Lysander instead. Also, Helena wants Demetrius to come back to her. Let's hear their theme. Maybe this is Hermia, maybe this is Helena. We don't know that for sure. But there is that characteristic gentles, gentleness about this theme. Because it's pitched higher, a fifth higher, there is a sense of tension there and so on, but that will resolve later. And this cadencing almost sounds like, you will do as you are told. But she won't, yes she won't. So now the mechanicals follow, also in the opposing key, as they, in their social status and clumsiness, represent the opposite end of the society. They're portrayed, you will hear it right away, by the interval of the perfect fifth, and by the sounds of stomping, as well as by the inevitable braying of the donkey, in anticipation of Bottom's temporary transformation. This is definitely an original moment of Mendelssohn's youthful slapstick comedy. And so on. <laughs> Finally, the hunting horns close the exposition in the key of B major as if to say, off we go to the forest now. And now Mendelssohn's development section opens with the fairyland again, as that is where the dispute is worked out. As you can tell, the fairyland now is again in the B minor key, right? The other realm um, of, the, of our uh, B key. It's not B major, it's B uh, minor. 
Um, and uh, you can see, uh, you will be able also to hear three important moments in it. So first, um, I would like to draw attention to these three things. The first one, uh, back to, uh, basically, um, uh, I was alerted to it in one of the books. It, it's a buzz uh, in the cello section that came from an actual fly, apparently. After an energetic horse riding exercise with his friend, Mendelssohn sat down in a shade and intently listened to a fly going by. Perfect pitch, eh? Perfect pitch. Later, when listening to a performance of the overture, he pointed out the fly in the development section. And as the sound is matched with the chord used to signal potion, I think that this might be Puck scurrying around and gathering the ingredients. chord, the buzz, and off it goes away. There's tiptoeing, which I'm going to mention also later. The second moment is when the potion is applied three times and Mendelssohn hears here its magic power in the horns. extra intervention. <clears throat> the third moment is that single moment of sadness at the very end of the development. Who has been made unhappy after all the potion has been used? Who is now all of a sudden not loved anymore? Hermia. Somehow, Lysander doesn't love her anymore and everything has gone wrong. She's presented here in the key of C-sharp minor, so that's sixth degree, the key relative to E major, which in the 19th century has been used also to portray a daughter, believe it or not. So let's hear that moment of sadness. So the development is over. This is the beginning of the recapitulation with the four chords, and not all is resolved yet. Oberon will still have a bit of work to do in the recapitulation. So as we look at the recapitulation, we'll see that it opens, as I said, with the four chords that we just heard, and Fairland, again, um, as Oberon still has a bit more work to do. Soon after, instead of Theseus that we had at the beginning, we hear the lover's theme, who are now in the home key of E major, so you can see that here at the bottom, settled and happy. They're followed by mechanicals, also in the home key of Theseus's court. A retransition proceeds without a modulation, so right here, keeping us in the home key and the spirit of the wedding. Theseus' theme enters as a conclusion, but not all is done just yet, as you can see. In the coda, we get the last glimpse of the fairyland again in the key of the parallel minor, in which Oberon, perhaps reminiscing on the night's events, blesses the royal court. The overture closes with the unchanged four chords as if to say, not much has happened here, it was all just a dream. So we'll just play this moment of Oberon so you can recognize it later when we listen to the whole piece. That's him. The potion 
of Oberon's doing. And all is well, back in the major key. Here Theseus' theme is about to enter in a much, much slower tempo to basically indicate the blessing of his court. No artist has ever captured their youth more perfectly than Mendelssohn in this overture to A Midsummer Night's Dream. Perhaps it was Fanny, his older sister, a music prodigy herself, a pianist, conductor, and a composer who best put into words what Felix has accomplished. We were saying yesterday what an important part the Midsummer Night's Dream has always played in our home and how we had all, at the different times, gone through all the parts from Peace Blossom to Hermia and Helena, and now it has come to such a glorious culmination. We were really brought up on the Midsummer Night's Dream, and Felix especially made it his own, almost recreating the characters which had sprung from Shakespeare's inexhaustible genius. All and everything has found its counterpart in music, and his work is on a par with Shakespeare's. Let's hear it now in its entirety, the first through and through piece of romantic music in its history.
Alexander, who's the third.
exactly as it should be. That's what it says in the bottom. And I bless their court. May they all sleep well. If we shadows have offended, think but this, and all is mended, that you but have slumbered here while these visions did appear, and this weak and idle theme, no more yielding but a dream. Gentles, do not reprehend. If you pardon, we will mend, and as I am an honest puck, if we have unearned luck, now to scape the serpent's tongue, we will make amends ere long, else the puck a liar call. So good night unto you all. Give me your hands if we be friends, and Robin shall restore amends.